Welcome to This Week in Intelligent Investing, where we examine timely and timeless investing topics to help you become a better investor. Enjoy authentic, unscripted discussion featuring Phil Ordway, Elliot Turner, and other thought-leading investors. Brought to you by MOI Global. And now, here's your host, John Michalczewicz. Welcome, everyone, to a new episode of This Week in Intelligent Investing. After Phil's terrific special episode with William Green last week, we've got the crew together today. Uh, Phil Ordway, Elliot Turner, great to have you guys. Let's start uh, with you, Elliot. Yeah, thank you so much, John. An awesome job last week, Phil. That was such a special, interesting episode. Uh, Love the book, and it was really cool to kind of Here's some of the thoughts and some of the questions you asked. So hoping we uh, get some more of those on the pod, and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, thanks. Me too. It was great. Uh, Thanks again to William for coming on. It was a good conversation. Yeah, that was was truly awesome. So um, on to this week's topic. I uh, wanted to talk about something like I've professed my uh, love for the um, reverse engineered DCF. Today, I wanted to talk about a part of DCF that I think is one of the most challenging and something that is like constantly subject to for debate and an area where there's, I think, a major market inefficiency and big opportunity. And specifically, it's what's the appropriate terminal multiple. And then relatedly, it's, you know, at what point do you slap on that terminal multiple? So um, when I started in this, I was doing a five-year explicit forecast period. And in just about every DCF, I was doing something like a 10% whack. 3% 3% terminal growth. So basically a 14X free cash flow multiple. McKinsey introduced me to the idea of going out to eight years instead of five. So that was a big step for me, bumping out my forecast period by three years and thinking a little more about whether this company is actually going to be terminal in five years or eight or whenever else beyond that. Um, but it also got me to spend a lot more time thinking about what a company will look like in the period I'm saying it's going to go terminal in my model, what rate should it be growing exiting that period, right? That's a really important question. What's the margin structure look like? And then asking myself, what do similar companies today with those growth rates and margin structures, uh, what kind of multiples do they trade at today? And uh, what multiples do those similar kinds of companies trade at a few years back just to make sure I'm not just a victim of my environment and thinking, you know, too narrowly and not thinking enough about where that should go or what's appropriate in a given time. Um, Because I realized, you know, every single time you'd say a company goes terminal in five years, if it grew for six years at a rate above GDP or seven or whatever else, you're adding significant value and you're not giving the company enough credit for what's truly appropriate in that case. Um, and then, you know, I've given myself one rule though. I want to always atrophy the multiple between now and terminal. I never want to say like, you know, the multiple is going to stay constant or God never want to say it's going to go up. And then another thing I've been doing more of as well is I'd always isolated on free cash flow as the appropriate multiple in an exit state. But I wanted to be more thoughtful and at least triangulate by thinking about, you know, is this company one that's going to be valued on EBITDA for a very long time? Is this company going to be valued on, you know, free cash flow, or maybe it'll be valued on a PE and, uh, you know, multiple of net income is far more appropriate. Um, You know, at least asking myself these questions has forced me to think about things a little differently um, and be more thoughtful than the starting point I was coming from. Um, And okay, so here's why I I, I had been thinking about this so much and why I started doing it. I think one of the biggest inefficiencies in the market is that the average sell sider is looking two years out and slapping a multiple on it. I've seen funny examples of analysts doing detailed DCFs alongside their two-year slap multiple approach and showing, illustrating that the DCF justifies a much higher target, but then saying, eh, I'm just going to go with my two-year multiple anyway, because that's what they do, right? That's what analysts are paid to do. Um, the average analyst who does a DCF at a buy side shop, I think, does pretty typically the five years, uh, then terminal, and you know, not necessarily that much thought into what's going terminal. Um, may, maybe there's even a bunch of shops that are like, oh, I'm just going to focus on the next six months and 
You know, what uh, is the trajectory of earnings? Is the company going to beat or miss? And those are like really different mandates, really different strategies. But when I could think like carefully and thoughtfully about what things look like um, and ask questions around that, um, you know, I found myself to get into some better situations and to think about things and ask different kinds of questions about the company. Like what's it look like today and what's it going to look like in the future instead of just isolating on what is there right now. Um, and then, you know, I think one of the arguments, some people are like, oh, why not just think in terms of even shorter term multiples and just say like, what's, what's the right way to approach this? Or maybe just go, you know, a couple less years, three to five years, which is consistent with my investing time frame. Um, and I think what what really is important to me, I, I I really like the idea of making explicit rather than implicit. If you're using multiple, you're just applying a shorthand for a DCF, uh, as Michael Mobson has demonstrated. And I think that's really dangerous. I think you could end up in some really troubled places if you don't know what's underlying your assumptions. Um, so you know, one of the contrapoints is I've seen the case made that people should do very long term DCFs. That if you do a thirty year uh, forecast, you don't even need a terminal multiple because the terminal value is going to be so small a portion of the total value as to be uh, irrelevant. And then you're making everything explicit. But you know what do I know about that far out? So I, I think eight years is a pretty good balance for me. Um, and then you know I just want to make the overarching point that every DCF is absolutely going to be wrong. You are never going to, going to make it absolutely right. Um, if you do, God, it's pure luck or something even sillier. Uh, but you know, given we know it's going to be wrong, it's really just to give color and perspective for where we do our work, how we focus our qualitative work, what kind of conversations we need to have to like really understand the business. And we need to do a lot of work around the persistence of the business, how long it has a right to exist for, how long customers want to engage with them for. Like those become the most fundamental questions. And I think that's where things get, uh, you know, your your result is going to be more determined by how you find answers to those questions and synthesize them in your process than what numbers fit out uh, by your model. Um, and then, you know, I think one uh, underlying theme to this is I'm talking about companies where there's a pretty long time and there's a decent amount of duration. And when you do start using a terminal multiple, that's more than like, you know, 14 X free cash flow in a given case, um, you are talking about taking a degree of terminal risk. And I think those situations, um, I'll call it, sorry, duration risk, not terminal risk. I think those situations, you end up with a little bit more volatility in the stock as well, because, um, that's what happens with duration. And, you know, one of the things I think a lot about is people tend to get FOMO. People tend to find an idea they really like, think it's really interesting, think there's a great five to 10 year outlook. I kind of think the world has kind of veered quite far from where it was um, five to 10 years ago when I was thinking about these things and making these changes in my process, like multiples are higher, uh, compounder bros are all over Twitter. And, you know, I think it's for the better in some ways, but one of the fears is like, you know, how much of what I'm saying is just purely circumstantial and a function of my environment. Um, and so, you know, part of combating that, I think, is setting FOMO aside and understanding that in these really good companies, if you are actually right about your analysis into why they have a right to extend their terminal period, um, you could check FOMO aside and trust that you may not need to own it right now, but you will get an opportunity in one, three, five, seven years, right? We're young. I think every one of us on this podcast would be considered young for the industry. Um, and so we should trust that uh, given, I know each of us is driven by a passion uh, and we're not mercenaries. We're here because we love doing this and we find it to be fun and it's the greatest like infinite puzzle in the world. And we're lucky to be a part of it. Um, so with a very long time frame, we'll get, a chance uh, to to do something with some of our favorite ideas, even if that chance doesn't necessarily come today. So checking uh, FOMO aside, I think is something that's really important. Um, Want to throw this question to you guys? Like, how do you think about terminal multiples? How do you think about DCFs in general? Uh, I know we've talked about this before, but maybe you know, chime in with any incremental new thoughts. Um, how do you think about? Um, you know, being a, is this a function of the environment? Am I just a victim of my environment? It would be interesting to hear some candid feedback on that too. Um, and, you know, I just would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I don't think you're a victim of the environment if you're asking the question. I think that's a great first start. So I think that almost by definition takes you out of being in the 
the stupid camp where you're just drifting along on the tide and don't even realize that that roar you hear in the distance is the waterfall you're about to plunge over. So I, I don't think that's a huge issue, but you raise a good question. And I don't know that I have a great answer in terms of how I like to deal with it mechanically other than to not do it very much mechanically. So like you said, I mean, we could sit here and debate it all day long. And it's, of course, the right framework, theoretical framework, for sure. Um, I've done so much work, for lack of a better term, kind of back testing my own process and looking at things that worked and looking at things that didn't work. And because I take notes and keep things written down in real time, I can look back into what I was thinking and what assumptions I was using. And it just points out how completely and utterly clueless I am most of the time. So I think it gets down to a question of which of the two sides are you trying to invest on? And if you're trying to speculate, that's obviously a whole other thing and kind of outside the, the realm of this discussion. But if you're trying to buy something on a reversion to the me kind of trade because you think something's temporarily beaten up and it's going to close the gap between where it's trading today and where it should properly be valued, this sort of thing gets really useful. And I think what you said about you know, tweaking your various assumptions, going out an extra couple of years, you know, not not necessarily capping the terminal value, but looking at other companies and figuring out where they were even just a few years ago, I think is hugely important. And I think that'll highlight some of those opportunities. I think they're fewer and farther between than they used to be um, in preparation for the William Green interview last week. I actually went back and read his article that he wrote. It was a feature length piece in, in Fortune magazine. I think it came out in December of 2001. It was he, he did the interview and wrote most of it in the weeks right after 9/11, and it was pretty stunning some of the individual position level volatility he was having, and he was making some decisions basically on the fly, all pretty much in the name of re, of reversion to the mean. But at the same time, his his single biggest his single biggest bet and position, which is absolutely fascinating, was in Amazon, right? And the the company he he started buying the damn thing in like the 80s per share. And it at one point fell to five dollars a share, like within a matter of months of him having initiated a very large position. So he was able to marry the concept of like, all right, this thing is oversold to use a term that I hate, and it's a great long-term bet. And he didn't go into the terminal value discussion, but my point is that there's very few of us that can do both of those things at the same time and then hold on for dear life, right? And he was doing it across the board, right? He was doing it lots of other companies, not just Amazon, and then. I would assume almost all of those cases, those are not securities he holds anymore, whereas uh, purportedly he's the single biggest individual shareholder in Amazon uh, outside of the Bezos family. So that's pretty interesting, right? And, and how did he go about doing it? I would posit that it didn't have anything to do with a superior process or insight um, regarding the DCF or the terminal multiple. He had a qualitative insight that this was a powerful business where the shared economies or the scale economies shared, as Elliot has talked about before, kind of shines through, right? And it's the single biggest, you know, anchor he can have in terms of something he can really hang his hat on. It's like, all right, look, this is a crappy day, a crappy year, a crappy quarter, but I know these are going to shine through eventually. And sure enough, it did. And, you know, ironically enough, I mean, another chapter in William Perry's book was about uh, Nick Sleep and his partner, uh, Kaya Sack, Zakaria, excuse me, and, and, you know, how they had a huge home run in businesses with shared or scale economy shared. And it was the exact same kind of thinking, right? I mean, I don't think they would say they ever had any uh, material edge on, on the terminal value or the right multiple. And so I think it just depends on which side of the equation you're trying to go after, right? If you're trying to play the long game where you think you have a qualitative insight that's going to bear itself out in the numbers over a period of years or even decades, you know, that's one question. And then you know, it, it kind of obviates the need for any of this. If you think it's more of a three to five year bet, which let's be honest, still puts you in the top tiny fraction of shareholders by long-term orientation, then this becomes a lot more important. So I, I try to do both. I don't think I'm particularly good at one or the other when one is the most important factor and the other one's somewhat irrelevant. I think a lot of times I talk myself out of good things by focusing too much on this, um, where I should learn to just you know, embrace the risk and own it for the long haul if I'm really that confident that I'm right. So anyway, that's a long non-answer to a good question. So sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'll jump in with my two cents. I think you guys uh, probably know by now that I'm not a huge fan of DCFs. I can't really make them work for me in terms of valuing a company. I, I do think they're 
somewhat helpful um, for certain types of scenario analysis where you want to play around with different assumptions and then you can kind of see how much uh, does the uh, does the DCF value get affected by various assumptions. And I also like, Elliot, your concept of the reverse DCF. Um, what I like to do in practice for me, rather than a DCF, if I'm looking at a growth business, the long-term secular grower, I like to kind of start with what's my earnings or FCF yield today? And then what's my conviction about the kind of rate of growth going forward, the duration of growth, and just kind of the long-term um, staying power of the business, the sustainable competitive advantage. So if I have a company like a Facebook, let's say, or Google or Amazon or any of those really high quality businesses where you feel like they will uh, grow for a long time to come, they'll grow above the rate of GP, GDP for a long time to come. And then if you're getting a current earnings or FCF yield, that's, you know, at least, um, a little bit higher than, let's say, the the thirty year uh, government bond yield. Um, you know, that's that can be a, a decent uh, start of an investment case uh, for a high quality company um, like that. So, where I really have trouble is companies that are losing money today. At some point, are supposed to start making money, and you know, your DCF can show a, a big value. But to me, their current earnings or FCF yield is negative. So that tends to be a, a non-starter just because I find the analysis too difficult. Um, in most cases, maybe there's a, a few cases where you can gain confidence just because they're reinvesting at very high rates and you're not seeing it in current numbers. But generally, that's how I look at it. I have a question, John. How do you look at it? So I, I come across this question all the time that kind of drives me to distraction and I don't know the right answer and I've struggled with how I should approach it myself. If you look at Amazon, which let's forget about that, right? It's it's so big and impressive and complicated. It's a one of a kind thing, right? It's like saying, oh, well, this is how I invested in Berkshire Hathaway or something, or well, this is how I forecasted the next 30 years in Berkshire Hathaway in 1975 or 1990 or whatever. It's just, it's such an outlier. It's almost not, worth trying to apply other than the broad pattern recognition, um, which again is highlighted pretty well in that chapter I just mentioned. But if you look at something that's a much, much simpler business like Costco, which again, the, the parallels are intentional and obvious, how would you have handled it? Because I've, I've gone back and literally done this, right? To like the, fear, the first few years after the IPO or whatever and said like, all right, you know, how would I have viewed this if I were looking at it in real time? And the only answer I can get to is if the unit economics makes sense, so whatever the unit economics are, either a store or a customer level, and if the broader business sense is there and the culture is right, which of course Costco passes with flying colors, you know that's kind of good enough. And you, you're almost just taking the leap of faith, right? Because it's it would be impossible if you went back 25 years, even I think, to put any sort of precision on what Costco has grown into, or Walmart, or certainly Amazon, right? Any of these businesses that have so much in common. So what's the point of even trying, right? If you got those qualitative things correct and unit economics correct, you'd already won, so stop chasing the car, right? How, how do you think about it? Yeah, I do think the qualitative uh, considerations are the most important. Um, so yeah, unit economics, you can use whatever metric you're, you're most comfortable with. And Elliot, I defer to you to kind of... Uh, with in terms of those specific metrics for let's say a business like naked wines i think uh, you can probably gain some confidence around their you know their re reinvestment rate and and how they're acquiring customers and the lifetime value and so forth um what i'm kind of talking about when i say i look at the current earnings or fcf yield and then assess subjectively um you know how much i believe in a business uh long term um, you know, that's that's something that maybe back in the day with Walmart or Microsoft early in their lives, um, they had positive uh, yields. They were small because, you know, they were pretty highly valued for those kinds of market environments. But nonetheless, they were already making some money 
And if you developed a ton of conviction um, on a Microsoft, which Buffett couldn't, or on a Walmart, which I think some people could, um, then you could um, justify investing for the long term. But again, it's it's not a mathematical exercise, really. Yeah, you know, I think in the book, Investing Against the Tide, uh, Old Fidelity Analyst had a great case study of Home Depot, which I think similarly to Walmart, um, they were making money on a net basis. They were not making cash, right? Because their investment was all happening below the line. So there's a legitimate argument to look at something like Naked Wines, who's not making money um, on a uh, net basis, though actually is making a little cash. Uh, incidentally enough, almost the opposite. Um, I, although I don't necessarily expect the cash to continue this year. Um, that digression aside, um, what I what I find important is to be able to think about the consequences of it and contextualize it and um, put together a coherent ex- a perspective on the unit economics and think about industry positioning and what's important. And sometimes there's more than one unit you need to be focused on. So like Naked Wines, I'm very keen on their um, contribution per case and their contribution per incremental customer, right? Each are as important as the other. Um, One tells a really important story about like how they're positioned relative to the industry. One tells a story about how their customers are interacting with them. And it's, you know, pretty, pretty significant. I think um, you know, you guys both make some really good points. Uh, I think the Bill Miller uh, invocation is an important one. I'm pretty sure I saw something recently that he doesn't even do models, let alone DCFs. Um, and he focuses all his work on the qualitative side and thinking about whether there's something to this. And I've seen tweets to the effect of like who I, I think we were just the other day, 20 years past the Google IPO, or maybe it was 18, something like that. Um, and the question was like, who could have predicted they'd be growing at this rate, um, this many years after their IPO? Like, who even had a model that was forecasting anything beyond five years? And you know, that's an important question. I ask myself sometimes, like, uh, and and the answer is obvious. So it's a stupid question in some ways, but I think it's a funny one and an important one. And in, insofar as like what you should be looking for as an analyst, like, if you told me I had the choice of buying a stock at a thirty percent discount to its DCF value over five years. And we were certain of that, um, that it was 30% cheap at the very least. Or we were looking, or we could buy a stock that on a five-year DCF, we were certain would extend its terminal duration that we don't know by how much. I would always take the one that could extend its terminal duration, not the 30% gap to DCF value, right? Curious what you guys would think of would take in that experiment. I'm saying both are certain, right? The 30% discount or the 30 uh, or the extension uh, of duration. I'd want to play with the numbers, but in theory, I totally agree with you that you know all else equal. If it were like a, I don't know how you even make it all else equal, but I agree. I think the duration of cash on the reinvestment opportunity is something I just way underappreciated for most of my life, and I agree. I, I would take that if I got that trade off all day long. That's where the compounding is really going to kick in, right? Yeah, agreed. It's just so hard. You know, how could you sit in the seat and say exactly what the world looks like in a bunch of years? And I think there's certain ways we could like focus and ask questions qualitatively and take some guesses. And I think that was one of the, um, I'm pretty sure, is in William Green's book where uh, Nick Sleep and and Zach were. Facing two, they faced two very severe losses in their careers on the quest to um, find quality and find these great companies. Um, I'm pretty sure in in at least one instance it was an outright they they had an outright zero, and yet you know you find a couple great ones and it way outweighs uh, some of those chances. Uh, so it's hard to ask some of these questions, but they're they're important ones. Yeah, I liked how they were down a lot in the financial crisis and in the teeth of it. He flew to New York and found out George George Soros was only shorting one stock and it was Amazon. I'd never heard, <laughs> heard that story before. And he like phones home like, huh, there's some pretty smart people over here that are uh, all taking the other side. Are we sure we're right? And I'd be curious if there was any way to go back and look to see if there was like some nihilism like built into that. Like, well, we've already kind of made this bet and it's too late now, so we might as well ride it out. Or if it was truly like unbridled confidence that like, no, we're definitely right. Um, I don't know. It's probably a mix of both, to be honest. 
it would be a great follow-up question to ask him. It would be really yeah. interesting. It's hard yeah. because people don't even remember. I mean, just like they can't forecast 20 years out, they certainly can't remember exactly what they were thinking 20 years ago. So unless there was a very reliable written or recorded record of exactly what they were thinking, and then, you know, I, I, even then I'd be a little suspect on that because, I mean, people's, when you're in that kind of turbulent environment, your opinions and your, you know, the big decisions you're making are changing so quickly. It's really hard to stay anchored, which they obviously did. I mean, all credit to them for sure. Um, I'm not trying to discount that at all. It's just, it's crazy to think about. And the Google thing, by the way, I think is another great example because I remember when it went public, I think it was either, I think it was 04. Um, I'd have to look, but it was, it was still so close. I was brand new, right? I didn't know anything about anything. It was still so close to the burning ashes of the dot com bust that I remember lumping it directly into that dismissive category. But let's say that somebody was smarter than that and said, no, no, you don't understand. Like this search business is unbelievably awesome. And it's not really a search business. It's an advertising business. And then, oh, by the way, these guys are going to turn into unbelievable corporate stewards of capital and capital allocators. And there's this thing called YouTube that's going to be like one of the best acquisitions of all time. Like you, you look like a maniac, right? Like you have no prayer to do that. So what I think the more interesting question is like, let's say you have the insight that the search business really is that good and it's going to be one of history's great businesses and it provides you enough cushion to the downside now to own it. Where do you step off the bus, right? Because one of the things that was so interesting was in that chapter on Nick Sleep was after they'd closed the fund, he sold half of his Amazon position at 1500 a share, right? So like he had all of this courage and this was, I think, a couple of years ago, I think it was pre-pandemic if memory serves. So like all of this courage and fortitude and he still left tons of money on the table. Like not that he needed it, but you, you get the point, right? So like, where do you check like to get off the bus? Like where do you find out if the valuation has gone too far? Or where do you find out if something's gone wrong? I mean, to me, that's almost the hardest possible question. It's hard enough to get the DCF right, you know, theoretically or mechanically, but it's even harder to figure out when to sell it, right? I mean, it's almost impossible. Sell strategy. I mean, I think this has come up. That, that's an evergreen topic about how challenging it is, especially in those situations. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know if there will ever be a totally right answer on that, too. For me, there might. I'm, I'm sure some people know, feel they have it figured out, at least. I think anybody has it figured out is kidding themselves. <laughs> Right. No, I mean, that is one of the more challenging parts. Um, I think, you know, Motley Fool has maybe the most figured out approach. And actually, Warren Buffett, too. It's like if you have incremental cash in, you don't have to think about selling. You just think about buying, make the decision once, make it a really good decision, and let it go. Um, and if you do have incremental cash, uh, every time you don't allocate some of that incremental cash to the, that one security, you're effectively selling it down a little as well. Um, so, you know, in some ways, that's the most constructive way to approach it, um, where you just take away, absolve yourself of that decision, kind of like Steve Jobs wearing the same black turtleneck every day, um, and leave yourself a little better off in the grand scheme of like how many possible decisions you could get wrong uh, along the way. Uh, but I don't have the stomach to sit through certain kinds of valuations, or at least in the same size. And I think. Uh, I don't know. There's um, that that saying, you can't go broke taking profits. And I think that's a really wrong approach to things. But at a certain point, you have to have a framework and you have to think about how how it fits in your framework. Um, I've faced this question a couple of times. I miserably failed at it a couple of times in more ways than one. I feel like I held on to the wrong ones, sold some of the wrong ones. But uh, you know, every once in a while, you get one right by luck. Uh, I've done that too. Um, it's part of the beauty of having companies that are like the true compounders that increase in value reliably and the stock tracks accordingly and doesn't oscillate wildly around a central mean. Um, I think that's part of what's made certain kinds of like low vol investing so successful uh, because while some of the companies aren't exactly sexy, they do just like very boringly do their thing every single year. And they don't leave you in those uncomfortable positions um, where, where you're exposed in a way to be so wrong. Um, I think that's part of the beauty of private equity too, where you don't have to think about these things. Um, you don't have to think about marks and, and force yourself. But then the beauty of public markets is you get just ridiculous opportunities sometimes that don't exist in those other contexts because of the volatility. So you take the good with the bad um, and you know try to make sure we're not... Like, like, 
volatility is risk because people aren't good at dealing with it. So you try to make sure you're not uh, in that same camp. Phil, that story of uh, Bill Miller buying Amazon at 80, holding down a five, is just absolutely nuts. I thought I had a bad buying Roku at like, you know, the high 30s and holding it all the way down into the 20s in, in 2018. Yeah, I mean, the lesson was, I think he bought, I mean, again, his fund was reasonably diversified back then, but it was still a big dollar amount and certainly put a dent um, in his tracker. I mean, he still outperformed the market despite all of that bloodbath. So I'd be interesting to go back and look at how big the position was as a percentage of his portfolio. But yeah, I mean, he he literally started buying it, I think, in 98. And the average cost was at or above 80. And because he bought it straight down, his average cost, I think, fell into the mid 30s by the time he was done. The stock was, you know, between five and 20 or 25 at that point. So he was still way underwater on it. But the point stands, right? That if you really have conviction, that's what you've got to do. And as a side note, I mean, this, this is another good lesson was I think I've told this story enough, but forgive me. When I first started in the business, I was assigned to cover the financial industry at a long short bond. And after about six weeks of learning the hard way, I realized we were staring over the edge of the abyss and ended up shorting everything under the sun. And the canary in the coal mine for me was Countrywide. And Countrywide was another one where it had actually outperformed Berkshire Hathaway over the trailing 10 years. And Bill Miller bought it all the way down. And he talks a lot in the book, not so much about Countrywide, but he talks about what a horrible period it was for him and how painful it was. And because of that, I kind of, in my youthful arrogance, dismissed uh, what he was doing right because he'd made such a public failure, right? And I mean, the guy who's turned in, well, always was, you know, one of those rare people who can do many different things well. And like the long term record is unbelievably good and the thought process behind it justifies it. So it was really stupid of me to waste, you know, all of that period. Like I could have bought Amazon in the financial crisis, right? Because he stuck with it. And, but I, I I was so dismissive of things like that back in the day. It was really self-defeating. So I've tried to talk myself out of that over time. It's a good sign. You're learning exactly the right way. And again, we're all young, so that's pretty important too. Let's hope, right? All right. Well, on that note, Phil, uh, let me turn it to you for your topic of the week. Sure. This will be a relatively quick one. I, um, Wanted to respond to an inbound question we got. We talked a few weeks ago about Mark Andreessen's essay in 2011, almost exactly 10 years ago in the Saturday Wall Street Journal called Software is Eating the World. And I talked about how, again, just like I was so wrong and dismissive of a lot of things at the time coming out of the financial crisis, this is another dead obvious thing that I just completely whiffed on. I mean, this is an essay where there's no mechanical valuation of anything. There was a few multiples around, but it's just dead right on almost everything that matters. And if you had read this essay and taken it seriously, uh, it would have benefited you dramatically. So now it sits in a folder on my desk and it's just an accordion file and it literally is labeled desk. And it's a bunch of papers and essays and data points and things that I want to try to force myself to reread pretty regularly. So this is not an exhaustive list of books. I have a obviously a big bookshelf as well. And I'm not going to sit here and talk about poor Charlie's Almanac or Thinking Fast and Slow or my other favorites like that. I mean, I, I think by this point, pretty much everybody that's listening to this will be familiar with those classic books. And if they're not, there's plenty of resources out there to find them. So I wanted to highlight just a handful of other essays, non-book uh, writing that I think has just enormously lasted the test of time and done extreme amounts of good in the world and helped really form uh, my thought process about things. And one of them uh, is actually, it, it kind of, I don't know if it was a direct response to Andreessen, but McKinsey of all places put out a paper in 2014 called Grow Fast or Die Slow, which I think is a really interesting framework that I've tried to think about quite a bit. And, you know, this could go back into read, pop and blitz scaling kind of thing. But I, I think it's a really good way to think about what companies are trying to accomplish and what they should be trying to accomplish. So that's an essay I would highly recommend reading in tandem with Software is Eating the World. But if there's just one essay that I would keep kind of pinned to my bulletin board, so to speak, it's actually an essay from a long, long time ago. I'd have to go look and see when it was first published, but at least 15 or 20 years ago, I would guess, uh, by a guy named Stephen Christ on horse racing and handicapping. And I, you know, the essay of it, something, or the title of it, something like, Christ on value, C-R-I-S-T. You can Google it and find it pretty easily. It was actually a, a, a talk that he gave, like so many great things like the psychology of human judgment or whatever. Most of the best stuff can be delivered in multiple formats. And this is certainly one of them. And it's just the single best exposition of a system or a framework for thinking about 
probabilistic environments that I think I've ever read. So again, like this is a guy, he had like a very fancy pedigree. I forget what all he did before he kind of found his niche in horse racing decades ago. But like the way he went about it was so logical and it applies to so many things. And it is so easy to think about if you have it readily available and it's so misunderstood and so needlessly ignored by people. So if anybody out there has not read that, I would highly encourage you to go think about it. And again, it gets back to a lot of the things that really vex me day to day. And it, it gets down to this notion. I mean, it's, it's tied directly to the foundational concepts of investing, right? And that's that. And of course, Charlie Munger and, and for Charlie's Almanac and elsewhere has talked about the market system as a peri-mutual system. And this applies that directly. But the, the key insight that I think so many people miss, at least in the current environment, is that when the odds change because of the inputs, like that reflexivity is so important that you have to take that into consideration. So this hit me right over the head about a half an hour ago when I saw somebody put out that Rivian has filed for its IPO. And I think they filed their S1 today or recently. And the, the planned valuation that they're shooting for is 60 billion, 60 billion US dollars of market cap in, in the valuation in the IPO. And that the revenue line is blank, <laughs> which, you know, you don't read too many S1s where the revenue line just literally doesn't exist. And it's kind of jarring, but it's like people don't understand that. Like that implies such an enormously bullish bet. Like the odds have been bid up so high that it's just almost hard to wrap your head around it, right? I mean, it's basically like saying a horse that's never run a race is going to win so certainly you shouldn't even consider any of the other eight or nine or 10 horses on the track. How many horses are in the race, right? I mean, it's just so insane that it's hard to kind of wrap your head around. And I think if you force people kind of like the, you know, how much do you want to bet, you know, mental trigger or verbal cue to, to trigger people? Like what kind of odds are being placed on Rivian at that valuation of 60 billion with no revenue, right? I mean, I think if you force people to change their bet on that, you wouldn't need to get into a big argument about terminal growth rates and terminal multiples because it would just frame it like, I don't know what the number is, but holy goodness, that is a big, high, fancy bet. And uh, it's really extreme. So that's one that's been hugely beneficial to me. Um, another one is there's a couple of essays on, on writing well. And one of the classics is David Ogilvy, the advertising executive, wrote a very short little blurb on how to write. And by walking through that, anytime I write any sort of correspondence of importance, an investor letter, an email, uh, that's really helped clarify my thoughts. I keep that pinned to my desk and would highly recommend it. Um, I also, there's a, it's not so much an essay, but again, it's an interview. Alice Schroeder, Warren Buffett's biographer, uh, she wrote The Snowball, which again is a, is a great book full of wonderful things. It's seven or eight hundred pages long plus, I think. And it's wonderful. And I devoured every page of it and I've read it two or three times at least. But she also gave a talk at the Darden School at the University of Virginia in late 2008, where she walks through Buffett's investment process, literally step by step. Um, and there's another example. I don't think it was at the same event where she walks through his investment process for Mid-Continent mid Tab which was actually a tech company way back in the day for all the people who push this false narrative that he doesn't understand tech or doesn't know how to invest in it. I would just argue that's obviously demonstrably false and he's just rarely in favor of the odds that he gets offered in that world. But anyway, those two things, I think, distill the investment process better than any book, better than any article, and uh, would highly recommend both of those. Uh, likewise, if you have access to it, um, it's kind of a shame, but the old investor Di Outstanding Investor Digest archives um, are an absolute goldmine. And it's a more of an informal conversation and back and forth and exposition of fundamental principles that have really stood the test of time. I mean, the glory days for those was almost 30 years ago, but you can still find a lot of those out there. I would highly, highly recommend those. Um, a few others quickly to run through. I mean, she's she's taken some flack over the years, but Mary Meeker's presentations on internet trends, I think are super valuable. Um, I think it's good to sit through. You have to sift through a lot of other stuff, but I think it's good to sit down with those periodically. And I keep one of those at hand pretty regularly. Um, a little longer duration, there's a couple of essays that I still don't think get enough attention. One is, is Zeckhauser's Investing in the Unknown and Unknowable. We've talked about that. It's hugely valuable. Uh, We're All Confident Idiots by David Dunning. Uh, I don't think we've talked about that one. I mean, that's just a great framework. Like as a step in every part of the process, like just pause and ask yourself, am I an overconfident idiot? right now. And that will help you avoid a lot of mistakes and miseries, I think, right there. Um, the Systems Thinker, A Lifetime of System Thinking, Systems Thinking by Russell Ackoff is just a classic. That you can't go wrong with that. Um, and, uh, and the last one I'll, I'll throw out is like just a kind of an exposition on how to write well. 
um, and think through uncertainty and probabilities. There's an author by the name of William Longavisha. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, former pilot turned journalist, and he wrote a series of articles for Vanity Fair back in the day. And I actually tried to reach out to just thank him for how awesome his work was. I was never able to actually find an email address or Twitter handle or anything or, or correspond with him, uh, even through a mutual friend. But anyway, um, if you go and read these articles, there's an especially good one called The Devil at 37,000 Feet. Um, you can go down the rabbit hole with these pretty quickly and spend a few hours just engrossed in some of the best writing I've ever read. And it really asks some deep fundamental questions about what people know, what they don't know, and what the environment means when you're trying to implement things under conditions of extreme uncertainty and stress, which maybe for some of you that sounds familiar if you've been dealing with markets at any point. So um, I'll stop there. Hopefully some of these are valuable and I'll open it up to see if John or Elliot, if you guys have anything that you would add to the list. Yeah, I had a couple that come to mind uh, just off the top beyond what we've talked about. I'd say read like the collection of uh, Michael Mobson essays at um, I think hurricanecapital.wordpress.com has the full collection. Um, those have been uh, very important for me personally in my development. Um, there was this interview that Paul Launcis did with Miguel Barbosa a bunch of years ago that was public on the internet, but I downloaded a copy and I think it's really awesome. I've read it like every couple of years. I think it's, it's really fantastic. Um, just a awesome introduction into the art of scuttlebutt and the importance of scuttlebutt in investment research. Um, I think it's an under discussed topic in general. Um, there's an essay by uh, Feng Gu and Baruch Lev that was in the Financial Analyst Journal called Time to Change Your Investment Model. It eventually became a book uh, called The End of Accounting, but you could get like, I'd say 80% of the value of the book in this one essay, and you could find that easily online. Um, one that I uh, came across and I thought was really interesting and it helped me think more about markets and the role of markets, the essence of markets and how they function is by uh, Michael Masters called Anthropic Finance and Better Markets toward a new understanding of how markets function and the role they serve in society. I think that was that was really great. Uh, next is a presentation uh, by Sanjay Bakshi called Floats and Moats. I thought that was really awesome and interesting. And he's a great storyteller. I have so that, that on my list too. Good. I cut it for, for clarity that I can't recommend that enough. It's a really good one. Yeah, it's really cool. His his I would I would recommend all of his presentations as well. I think there's something you can learn in every single one of them. For sure. Um I, I'm blanking on the name, but there was one about Buffett as a momentum investor. And just you know, the idea, the the idea of approaching it from that angle is funny and interesting. And he makes a compelling case. But it's so different than what you'd expect. So, you know, definitely seek that one out. Um, and then outside of investing, I mean, I really love David Foster Wallace's essays. But if I were to give a shout out to one, it's the one on Roger Federer. So, um, you know, it, it's good to read beyond just the perimeters of what we do. So I think that's an interesting one. Those are some yeah, that I come to mind. I should have added to the Mobus and essays. I almost lumped in the same category of things that I think are just so fundamental. You should. Go right there. A few other things while I'm at it, I, I wrote down uh, to share is I think Trent Griffin's essays actually don't get enough credit. I mean, he's put an enormous amount of time and effort. Absolutely. Into those. Morgan Housel's essays, I think, get relatively more attention largely because of the book, but for good reason. I couldn't recommend those enough. And even Paul Graham, I mean, he's a, I think, a legitimate celebrity, but his essays are, are really fantastic. And I've got a handful of those in the same folder as well. So I'd recommend all of them. And I'll throw out one like sort of book that's different that I don't even know how I first came across it. It's called the art of profitability by Adrian slow whiskey. I think definitely butchering the name and I apologize for that, but it's truly awesome. Each chapter is a breakdown of a different business model told in an interesting way. And the book gives you like a hundred follow-up readings that you could do, but it's not really a book. Like he recommends reading just like one chapter a week for the course of a few weeks and like thinking about it and meditating on it. And I, I, I would strongly recommend that. Well, guys sucks to go last. Cause you guys pretty much 
mentioned everything I was going to say. Um, you know, Phil, the bar is really high in the category of things that are kind of truly evergreen and timeless and that you go back to over and over again. Um, so, you know, I every, everything I'm going to say is going to be super obvious. And you guys have said things like the Michael Mobison essays, uh, Howard Marks, Berkshire letters, uh, the Bow Post letters, if you can get your hands on them. Uh, I agree. Paul Graham has some great essays uh, as well that tend to be timeless. Um, you know, for me, a book that I go back to a lot is is the uh, George Soros classic Alchemy of Finance. Um, so so maybe uh, rather than kind of uh, repeating uh, what you guys have already said, I think uh, just a slightly different uh, approach to give folks uh, more uh, things uh, to put on their list. I think we live in an age of some really, really great uh, newsletters out there and uh, credit to um, you know, Substack for providing that platform. Of course, Elliot and I hope that uh, that'll be Twitter at some point with review. Uh, but there are some really good Substacks uh, that one can sign up for um, basically at no cost and then choose to upgrade uh, if, if it's something um, great. But even Roger Lowenstein now has a Substack. Yeah. Um, Eric Newcomer is one uh, I follow. Uh, the folks over at Ensemble Capital uh, have written some great um, series and great uh, pieces on uh, various investing topics. Uh, I'd recommend that. Uh, their blog is called Intrinsic Investing. Um, so a bunch of other, um, uh, other things maybe we can include more in the show notes. Yeah, the show notes could be pretty lengthy. A couple more I'll throw out just uh, while we're on it. These are more big ideas that I think are exemplified by these examples. There was an interview uh, in the Financial Times with Sir James Dyson of the eponymous industrial company that he's run about the art of making quick decisions that I thought was just fantastic. And you look at somebody where we've talked a lot about how investing is such a paradox of two things at once and the ability to hold two competing ideas at the same time, and his ability to focus incredibly intensely for years and decades on end, but then also just pull the plug right away is just truly incredible and something that we should all try to train ourselves more toward. I mean, likewise, Danny Kahneman's talked about how he likes changing his mind and how he'll write an entire chapter for weeks or months and then throw the whole thing in the garbage can. I think that's a hugely valuable idea. We've also talked before about how I, I think you have to be mindful of the slippery slope, whether it's in terms of cutting your own cutting corners in your own investment process or with companies that are cutting corners. And uh, Howard Schillett wrote a great book called Financial Shenanigans. He also gave a speech uh, of the same title in 2010 coming out of the financial crisis. And I think it makes the great point, which is that it's all about the slippery slope, right? I think he would maintain, I don't think he talks about it explicitly, but he's kind of getting at it. And I would certainly agree that you look at Enron or you know, even Madoff for that matter. Some of the great frauds in history, they probably didn't start out as frauds, but the canary in the coal mine was that they had these little financial shenanigans going on and it was the sign of the slippery slope. And you didn't really know where on the slope the negative snow snowball was rolling, but it was catching speed and momentum and rolling the whole way down. And it's just something you have to be mindful of. Likewise, a classic I remember reading in business school that I'll never forget was, how, have you ever tried to sell a diamond? I think it ran in the Atlantic for the first time, like in 1982, if I'm correct about that. And it was just about this ephemeral nature of like, there's nothing really more timeless than a diamond per se, but the market for diamonds is totally artificial and total nonsense. And I think the same holds true in a lot of financial markets where if you really had to operate in a rational world, like what you thought you had in terms of a store of value, if you went to reach for it, you just come back with air. I mean, it's all, it's all hot air. It's all nonsense. And uh, I think you have to be mindful of that, right? I mean, if you're going to speculate on the price of something, um, you know, Bill Miller's certainly been very, uh, very correct, I guess, for lack of a better word, in his speculation on Bitcoin. But I think he would admit at the same time, there is no intrinsic value to Bitcoin, right? And if you need to go to sell it one day, you may reach for air. Uh, I don't think that's a controversial statement. I think that's just obviously true. And I think it's a good framework to keep in mind. And it's a fascinating article to read about that industry. The last one I'll point to on the, on the flip side of the coin, I talked a lot about the importance of writing while the David Ogilvy memo was uh, there's an article in the FT and 
2017 by Lucy Calloway called How I Lost My 25-Year Battle Against Corporate Claptrap. She means nonsense, BS, and we talked a little bit about this last year, and I think it goes really well with the, the Howard Schillett speech, so I would certainly recommend that. I'll just throw out one other resource that has some incredible um, classic articles uh, on there, uh, longform.org. If you go to longform.org slash best, let's say, it has some of the best articles going back, you know, 20 years or so. And uh, you can also browse it by section. So for business, uh, it has some really, really good stuff uh, that's freely accessible online. All right. Well, Phil, you started us off saying this is going to be a quick one. It was uh, a little bit more, but I think when you get us started on uh, (laughs) highlighting our favorite uh, sources and and, and texts, uh, it can get long. And I'm sure the show notes will be an important one for this episode. Thank you so much, guys. It was a, a great one. I hope everyone listening enjoyed it as well. Take care for now. Talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to This Week in Intelligent Investing, brought to you exclusively by MOI Global, the research-driven membership organization. Learn more at moiglobal.com.